Lecture 4.2, Innovation and Poverty. In the first lecture for this unit, we looked at how and why the path to wealth taken by Western economies was essentially paved with technological improvements. We described the link between entrepreneurship and innovation and identified the ways that markets reward innovation and punish the failure to innovate. The proof is in the numbers. For most of human history, economic growth rates were only a fraction of 1% per year. At that rate, improvements in standard of living are virtually non-existent. We can use the rule of 72 to illustrate to students the intractable persistence of abject poverty at that level. The rule of 72 is an easy way to figure doubling time. In this case, the length of time it would take for incomes and standard of living to double. We divide 72 by the rate of change, in this case, the rate of economic growth. So, for example, if income is growing at 3% annually, it will double in 24 years. But if economic growth is 6%, then income will double in only 12 years. That's amazing. Think what even 3% growth, a not uncommon rate in the modern world, means to people's lives. 24 years means that in your own lifetime, the standard of living will double. You can see and remember improvements and have hope that your children will be better off than you are. And if it doubles in only 12 years, or at 9%, say, in 8 years, amazing changes. That's what's happening in China today. But now, let's go back to the bulk of human history, when economic growth rates were less than 1%. At 1%, doubling time is 72 years, far greater than average life expectancies. At less than 1%, it would take several hundred years for incomes and standards of living to double. And remember that they're doubling from a very, very, very low level. At that rate, people can't even foresee better lives for their grandchildren. It was around the time of the Second Industrial Revolution, the late 19th century in the Western world, that growth rates moved above 1% annually, a significant improvement that meant standard of living could double within a person's lifetime. As we begin the 21st century, it's not uncommon to see economic growth rates that allow income to double more than once in a person's lifetime. Unfortunately, as we've seen, much of Africa and parts of Asia and Latin America have growth rates that offer people no expectation and little hope of a better. As we discussed in earlier lectures, markets and innovation can help to push growth to higher levels. However, even the shortest of doubling times means little to our current inquiry unless we can show that growth confers benefits on the poor. If innovation only serves to make the rich richer, then there would be little reason to seek out institutions that encourage it. Fortunately, that's not the case. Throughout history and continuing today, technological change and innovation have made greater quality of life changes for the poor than for the rich. Start with just a common sense numerical analysis. A 10% increase in income for a poor person means improvements in food, clothing, housing, and medical care while a 10% increase for a rich person makes little qualitative change in lifestyle. Add to that the historical evidence. In the first century after the Industrial Revolution, GDP and living standards grew slowly. But in the century after 1850, they took off. Between 1850 and 1914, GDP per capita more than doubled in the market economies of the West. More importantly, however, income inequality declined. Thus, the per capita average did not hide a rich-get-richer phenomenon. Social indicators clearly tell us that the lives of the poor got better. Food and housing consumption grew rapidly. Infant mortality declined. And life expectancies increased. Population studies show us that in industrializing Britain, for example, the tripling of population between 1750 and 1850 was not accompanied by increased famine or disease. 
This in sharp contrast to famine-prone Ireland, where the slow spread of technology kept population and standard of living low. While we can't measure the degree of improvement with precision, we can find clear evidence of the ways in which innovation improved life at all income levels. Evidence we may overlook today because it seems so mundane. Underwear, for example. Right, cotton underwear and clothing that was once the luxury of the rich. Innovations in cotton processing led to such great increases in supply and reductions in price that the comfort of cotton clothing became available to the masses. Not only were there benefits in comfort, but because cotton is so easily laundered, the spread of cotton clothing is also associated with improvements in health and cleanliness. We can list item after item, from canned vegetables to smallpox vaccines, that conferred its greatest benefits on the poor, even if we cannot measure those benefits with precision. The phenomenon continues today. The unit outline contains an extended case study of the life-changing impact of cellular phone technology on the poor of sub-Saharan Africa. For the developed world, the cell phone is an added convenience, a faster, more accessible means of communication. But in much of Africa, where the estimated weight for landline phones is measured in decades, the cell phone is life-changing. Newsweek writes of a 14-year-old who uses his cell phone to make a living guarding cars parked on the streets of Johannesburg. A street vendor in Nigeria uses hers to call her son with instructions about what to harvest from the garden to fill the orders left by workers at her stand in the morning for pickup on their way home from work. A farmer orders parts for a broken plow and doesn't miss a day's work walking to town. A mother calls to arrange delivery of medicine for a sick child. Mundane, routine for us, life-changing for the poor in developing countries. We also find that the importance of knowledge and technology to enterprises and competitive markets has changed business attitudes towards knowledge and information in ways that are beneficial to the world's poor. Businesses that once considered all technological advances to be proprietary knowledge and closely guarded are now displaying a greater propensity to encourage the dissemination of that knowledge. Why? Because they've discovered that it pays to rent, sell, or even give away technological know-how for the simple reason that a bigger market means more customers. As Balma explains in The Free Market Innovation Machine, Firms have discovered that technology trading allows the market to grow faster, and they reap the benefits in their bottom line. Similarly, globalization and reduction of trade barriers not only increases the size of the market and therefore the potential reward to innovation, but it also increases competition, strengthening both positive and negative incentives to innovate. As countries like China open their markets to entrepreneurs, the ranks of the innovators swell, and the dissemination of technology means that the cascade of innovation, innovation begets innovation, grows and grows and grows. As we tout the benefits of innovation, a caveat's in order. While there are net gains to society of technological change, innovation, like all economic change, creates both winners and losers. And even as we celebrate the benefits to the many, the losses of the few are nonetheless real. It doesn't matter today that there's no longer a thriving buggy whip industry in the United States, but it mattered to buggy whip makers as the automobile replaced the horse. And the advent of the pocket calculator mattered to slide rule manufacturers. Schumpeter's explanation of creative destruction helps us to understand that this process is beneficial in the long run, releasing resources from less valued uses to be used in more valuable ways. His contention is bolstered by the evidence. Displacement of workers has always been exceeded by creation of new jobs. In fact, historically, there has never been a long-term rise in unemployment. In the short term, however, business failure and job loss exist. The question market economies face is whether we're willing to accept short-run dislocations that affect some in return for long-run growth with net benefits. 
The evidence is clear that willingness to accept the consequences of technological change, that there will be winners and losers, is characteristic of the world's wealthiest economies. Some nations with market economies do more and some do less to directly help those who lose their jobs and income to technological change, but all accept that failure and loss are an inevitable and, in the long run, beneficial part of economic growth. Before we close, let's return to Michael Novak and Business as a Calling, where he argues eloquently that the best evidence that the innovative nature of capitalism is good for the poor comes from the actions of the poor themselves. He notes, I offer then two propositions to whose truth much powerful evidence attests. First, better than other sets of economic institutions, capitalism makes it possible for the majority of the poor to break out of the prison of poverty, to find opportunity to discover full scope for their own personal economic initiative, and to rise into the middle class and higher. Sound evidence for this proposition is found in the migration patterns of the poor of the world. From which countries do they emigrate, and to which countries do they go? Overwhelmingly, they flee from socialist and third world countries, and they line up at the doors of the capitalist countries, often in long lines curving around the corner, like theater goers queuing up for a Broadway hit. He continues, A second way of bringing sound evidence to light is to ask of virtually any audience in almost any capitalist country how many generations back in family history they have to go before they reach poverty. For the vast majority of us in the United States, we need go back no further than our parents or our grandparents. In 1900, a large plurality of Americans lived, as the world went, in comfortable rural poverty. Their living conditions, however mean, were still better than those of virtually all other world populations, hence the tide of immigrants to these shores. Still, by today's standards, both their rural comfort and their urban immigrant settlements in the crowded cities were barely higher than subsistence. They were poor. Yet most of these same families today are described as affluent. Capitalist systems have raised up the poor. We know this from our own families. We remember poverty. Let me make this point another way. In the year 1800, demographers estimate that there were only 750 million people on Earth. Some calculate that the average age at death was then about 18. Just 196 years later in 1996, thanks largely to new discoveries in such fields as sanitation and hygiene, medicine and pharmaceuticals, the number of living humans surpassed 5.5 billion, and the average age at death has risen to more than 58 even in the poorest nations and to over 75 in the advanced nations. Because more people live longer, more are alive at this moment, and their material conditions are far better than those of 200 years ago. I've heard the argument that most of these people are alive today because of technology, not capitalism. But whence came the drive to advance technology, and not only through gaining knowledge, but by bringing it to markets that carry it to billions of individuals, if not from an enterprising, dynamic market system? How many pharmaceuticals do you have in your home that were developed in communist countries? Enterprising firms striving to bring one discovery after another to market learn by experience how to spot still other technological possibilities. Over the years, they acquired the practical know-how to bring these possibilities to market in the most desirable and cheapest forms they could. If they did not do so, they knew their competitors, actual or potential, would. The former Soviet Union trained possibly the largest body of scientists and technological experts ever assembled in history. Yet all these brains brought pitifully little of the knowledge they acquired into the common service of humanity. They had little incentives and no market system to enable them to do so. So far as the common people experience, knowledge apart from markets stands idle and out of service, like a broken down bus.